Welcome to the West Side Barbell Podcast. Today's guest is Miles Robinson. Miles, pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. How long have you been training here? About eight and a half years. How did you end up coming to West Side? Was it through Matt or was it through AJ? How did you get in here? Uh, combination of Matt and AJ. Uh, actually, it's really, I just thought of it on walking over from the other side. Uh, I think there's a video online of my first day in here. Mm -hmm. uh, I was coming in with AJ because AJ was training with Matt and I was training with AJ. So, and his car was broken down. Yeah. So I had to take him to all his practices right. yeah, in order to, for him to practice and then for me to get any training whatsoever. So I think I was in the parking lot watching everybody train because I wasn't allowed in the gym because it was like, who the fuck is this guy? Um, but Pate, had missed a deadlift and everybody was talking shit and AJ was like I think Miles could probably pull that and you're like if you could pull you can train and I walked in I think I pulled like 505 cold Damn. like had no terrible yeah. technique freaking <clears throat> overextended my back and everything and ever since then it's been been here how close was that to the day we brought the sleds to the park um, was that around the same time? That same time frame. Time they, yeah, there was that same camp. Um, yeah, because Pape was living in town. And I think that was probably three weeks before then. Gotcha. So it went from not doing any of this shit to we're in the woods with <laughs> <laughs> dying, wondering why the hell I didn't stay in school. <laughs> we yeah. thought it was a good idea to bring two plates and a sled, a 100-pound med ball, and to... Yeah. Track through the forest. Track through the forest. Uh, if anybody knows where Battelle Park is and uh, that little wood, wooden path through there, that was that was rough. That was that made me question <laughs> question a lot of things that day. Why MMA? Um, that answer has changed over over the years. It started off. Um, obviously, AJ was my friend. I've known him since high school. Uh Initially, was talking shit to him about uh, we used to slap box at one of our friends' houses and probably mouthed off a little bit too much. And he invited me to the gym um, and got my ass kicked and enjoyed it, which is weird to say. Um, but over time, uh, it's something I use to kind of learn about myself. I get to test myself. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's many things that you can do as a person that you learn more about yourself than getting into a fight with another another human especially how we go about it when you're locked into a cage there's nowhere to go it's you your hard work that you put in or maybe that you haven't put in your thoughts and someone else that has put in that same amount of work or maybe they haven't but mm -hmm. we're gonna find out here um getting in a fight in the street you can leave things can end there's not rules but people stop fights when yep. you get taken down um uh, one of the one of the first things that I learned in a, uh, doing MMA was I got taken down by a guy that looked like a substitute teacher. I can't even remember his name, and I couldn't do anything about it. And I remember me talking to AJ <clears throat> after that. I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, this guy, I'm, I've been built like this since I was in about, like, probably a sophomore year of high school. Yeah. So I've always been a big, strong guy. And going into a sport where – someone that's like 145 pounds can ball me up and there's nothing I can do was a big drastic change in my psyche and my ideology of like how interacting with people is like you can't talk shit to to this dude on the street anymore because now my whole brain has been open to a whole nother world of people that look like normal people but are extremely skilled in what they do and work hard at what they do and I want to test myself against that so yeah. I think I trained for about a year and at some point I lost a little bit of the martial artist, but I started off as wanting to learn and then learning things about myself and then wanting to test myself and get into a little bit of competition. Got to, my, to a point where skill wise, I felt, I feel like I'm good enough to at least compete in this mm -hmm. and then go from there. What sports did you do growing up before MMA? Um, football. I look like a running back. Uh, thought I was a basketball player until I got <laughs> cut. <laughs> thought, yeah, swear yeah. to God, I thought I was a basketball player. And funny enough, uh, got cut from my high school basketball team 
And when I got cut, walked out of the gym, <clears throat> and the wrestling coach was like, come on up to the wrestling room, because I don't know why you thought you were a basketball player. Um, and then I ran track. So uh, all around athlete, um, wrestled only through high school, like my sophomore year. So sophomore, junior, senior year, I wrestled, and that kind of gave me my initial base for yeah. MMA. But it was really just always been like an explosive athlete. Track was probably my best sport, but – wrestling and being able to have something where I can affect my own results mm -hmm. is kind of what, what stuck with me. Do you remember any of your track results? Uh, I ran a 22-4, 200-meter and a 10-800 in high school. Damn. Um, wasn't, like, the fastest person. I also didn't really take it all that seriously. Yeah. Um, I've always been, like, kind of, like, go-with-the-flow kind of guy, um, which my dad used to fucking hate. But in high school, I would just show up, have some fun. It was social hour. Girls running around with short shorts on, and it's summertime, and I get to run fast. And I'm decent at it, so I yeah. was, like, the cool guy being able to do it. But, yeah, I ran, like, a 10-8. It wasn't, like, ever, like, fast enough to, like, go to college or anything. Um, but if I probably would have put a little bit more effort in, I probably would have been able to do a little bit of something with it. You ran a good 42, right? Yeah, I think I've ran like a 4-4, four, 4-3. Four, four, I've like had really good straight line speed. Yeah. Um, but if you told me to go left and right, everything fell apart. It was, it was, <laughs> my football highlights is me running fast and going to cut and falling down. <laughs> this is my high school football take. What was your training like before getting here? Bench, squat, and eat a little bit. Like uh, high school, we, we did um, bigger, faster, stronger, yeah. um, BFS, um, and that's all I knew. Before high school, my dad, my dad's a military guy. My dad's kind of was built like me when yeah. he was younger. Um, so we used to run and do push-ups. So that kind of is where like I've been built since like a young age. Um, we used to wake up every morning, do push-ups, sit-ups, and squats, and then run, like, during the summer. Um, so that carried me on. And then the soft, yeah, again, sophomore year, uh, I started touching, like, weights for real. Mm -hmm. And I went from skinny with muscles to, my, like, the miles that you see now. Didn't have any idea of, like, what I was doing, why I was doing it, or what the – what really results were i wasn't tracking my weights at all um but i was naturally strong and yeah. kind of got got through that way um coaches loved coming into the weight room and like you, i pick anything up or put it on my back i feel like it can move so that's kind of where i got my dumb gene <laughs> dumb gene yeah. from um but yeah just bench squat deadlift never even really did like any accessories it was kind of just like football meathead lifting yeah yeah. What was um, <clears throat> your initial impression of when you started training here? What the fuck are we doing? Like, <laughs> what, what the, <laughs> I got thrown in. So that was in the middle of Matt's camp. And um, the one thing that I really think is interesting, um, especially looking back on it, is there was never a um, ramp up period. It was you're here, you're doing what the team's doing. Yeah. So my first day, like literally that first day, yo, Pape's deadlifting. It's, he missed that. Can you do it? Hop in and hopped in and done. And then that kind of set like the mindset going forward was there isn't any ramp up. You're just going to hop in and do what the guys do and acclimate fast. Otherwise you're going to get left. Yeah. Um, I was really, really sore for as long as I can, <laughs> I can remember um, but I knew that I was getting stronger. I saw the correlation from, all right, maybe I'm not as technical as some of these guys are when I'm going from doing my lifts to my training, but now I'm being able to bridge that gap technically right now with, damn, I'm strong as shit. I'm yeah. getting a lot stronger. I'm taking kind of like, had like a frame for a, like to be strong and then finally getting like the proper coaching to actually use the most out of what I've been given by God. You know what I'm saying? I have big ass legs, but you have big ass legs and they can't move nothing. What's the point yeah. of having them? Now I've got kind of a, a basis and um, base to build everything off of. Um, 
that was the first thing that I, I recognized was like, damn, I'm starting to ragdoll these guys. And I don't really know what the hell I'm doing. I just know I'm strong. And I saw a difference where, again, I started showing up with Matt. I wasn't training with Matt. I was there with being yeah. AJ's training partner. And I feel like, and I, I could talk to him probably about it, at some point, me and Matt's mind trained, like, yo, th there's something to this guy to where he's strong enough I can utilize this. Yeah. I'm not going to find many people that are this strong that are going to be at 170 pounds, so let me utilize this. And that's kind of where I was learning through osmosis at that point in time and getting strong and strong as hell at the same time. It was a interesting dynamic because we had to get everyone up to par to train with Matt because Matt mm -hmm. ran his camps different than most fighters. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was good in one sense in that we could control a lot, but Matt and Matt, you didn't know where he was going. <clears throat> he may have to go to Colorado, may have to go somewhere mm -hmm. else, but the group always stayed together. Yeah. And then I remember it got to a point where the whole group got so strong and Matt comes in like, what? Strong as fuck. What, like, what is, yeah. what's going on here? Yeah. And, um, but it made him step up his game to where like, well, I can't be the yeah. weak guy in the group. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to see that dynamic. And you were there when we were all going through a learning phase to where I was trying to figure out <laughs> what volume was. <laughs> uh, turns out we found out what the maximum amount of volume you can do in a training session mm -hmm. is. All the weight can be moved <laughs> yeah. for all the time. <laughs> but what I, I think went for, what I took for granted or just thought it was just normal was the culture of the group. Mm -hmm. I think the group culture was the one that really developed out of that everyone got strong which is like yeah. look it's not the most difficult thing in the world when mm -hmm. people are consistent right but actually keeping people consistent was uh, like to where you guys were going through the ringer yeah because matt would take fights like he would fight anyone anytime so mm -hmm. he would take a fight on maybe eight weeks notice two weeks notice we didn't know so we're always ramping up to it so when right. people come in as you said there was no there's, in, there's no training to train you're in here mm -hmm. um but I, I remember like a few turning points with you was like the uh, when your sumo deadlift started shooting up, mm -hmm. then your box jumps just started going on a, another level. And then Matt would come back and give feedback of like what was happening in training because mm -hmm. he was like phenomenally good at like, hey, here's what all these guys are doing. Right. Um, did you understand like how special the group was, like how, how, how good that culture was when you're in it? No, not while we were in it. Uh, I think we were all kind of in crazy points in our in our lives, and it's it's interesting looking back at that time because it that honestly was madness. Like, but that crew and group held each. I think we did a really good job of holding each other accountable mm -hmm. as much as possible with how nuts everybody was individually, um, and how nuts everybody was individually kind of fueled so. TJ, for for instance, TJ, a madman. You talk any kind of shit to TJ, no matter what it is, whether it's being late or anything, he's gonna take that internally and it's a fuck you. Yeah. I'm gonna gonna beat you. And everybody kind of gravitated toward and developed those kind of personalities. And I don't even know if necessarily we started off like that, and then we got into this fucking sucks, <laughs> and it kind of developed like we were kind of. It was fun. It was yeah. a lot of fun, but I feel like in that point in time, we were all pretty, pretty young and figuring shit out about ourselves and each other. And everybody's trying to figure out what their, what their point is, uh, what their place is in the group. And if you're an outsider coming into that, we kind of had a way of communicating with each other. And if you come into that, it's fuck you yeah. um, until you acclimate to what we're doing. And if you can't, it was fuck you. Anyway, so Good luck. off with you. Good luck. Um, but that dynamic, I feel like, pushed everybody. You didn't want to be the odd odd person out. And if you were the odd person out, you're working hard as hell to... No one wanted to be the person getting talked shit to. Like, yep. uh, every, not people listening probably don't know my personality outside. I'd never shut up. It's like a, I have like a gene <laughs> that it just doesn't stop. And with that, I got to have some tough skin because... I'm around other alphas that you're not just going to keep talking to me, especially if you're hearing me chirp. I'm chirping 24-7. And 
I had other guys that, that were like that. And it was awesome having having mm. that dynamic to where I can talk shit to you. You're going to talk shit back. No one's going to take it all that personal. And if someone does take it personal, we can figure it out because we're all fighters. We can go figure this out and get right back to it without if anybody's ego, per se, getting getting into it. Like, the fact that we all stayed together for that period of time without anybody, like, that core group of guys, like, having, like, really any issues. Like, I have yeah. fond memories of all, all the guys that came through is wild with the people that we had there. Like we had some nuts, <laughs> some off the off the chain people in that in that group. But I fucking love those guys. The because uh, we went from the traditional four day system, which are the two max effort days and two speed days, mm. which was was good, but it wasn't gelling because you guys had so much other stuff to do. Because at the time when everyone was working or mm. either in school, dropping out of school, trying to get a job. Matt was like, he was training full time, mm -hmm. obviously, but to where there are so many disciplines and depending who is in town. So if a Dorian is in town or if he's working with Adam or maybe it was when mm -hmm. uh, Beecher is coming in, Kazeki had all these people coming in and out. Right. The four day system wasn't doing well. And we're like, okay, which I thought was going to be a, like detrimental to the group. But we moved to that three day system. Then you're like, okay, everything started stepping up because mm -hmm. those dynamic effort days got real, real heavy. Real heavy. That accompanied with the punishments for being late. Mm -hmm. When everyone went through the phase of like, to where I was like, fuck this, we just can't. Mm -hmm. You can't keep coming in late. Yeah. Because we're trying to do stuff at, at the office because nothing ever stopped. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like, Matt had twins at the time, so he had... Mm -hmm. uh, I won't say an excuse, but he legit had to deal with stuff. But the group should never be late. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, until Harold brought up, I forgot I kicked everyone out, brought yeah. everyone back in, kicked everyone out, brought everyone yeah. back in. But then that's when punishment came in. If you're late, hell. It, it was hell. And I think that birthed the monster that is TJ. Because yeah. he kept coming in late. He got and punished. So it used to be, if you were for every minute you were late, you would pick the exercise and you add a plate. Mm-hmm. TJ, got hand. yeah, got so, he would come in so late that he would have four plates on a sled. He would have uh, eight plates on a wheelbarrow. And then he would have a plate on the safety squat yeah. bar. I think at some point he had to have been showing up late on purpose yeah. and was just realizing he was getting stronger than yeah, he was. Be, he, he, like, he was, he went, he went from to where he was all over the place and he was so sporadic to becoming like the top dog when, when it comes to conditioning. You couldn't. Yeah. You, you couldn't do anything with him anymore. There was no. nothing. But I remember the one day he came in early, and I can't remember who came in late. And I've never seen a guy so happy. No, it was no, it was uh, Khalil had come in. Oh yeah, Khalil yeah. and JJ had come in late, and the amount of joy for putting someone through something <laughs> yeah. was was wild. I think Khalil Khalil left his <clears throat> sled in the middle of the parking lot and was like, "I'm I'm done," because why? Why are we doing? Why are we doing this? And yeah, TJ. If you think David Goggins is like a, a hard dude, TJ during that period probably would run Goggins off. Off like well, he I saw him <clears throat> like a safety squat bar sled stacked up, war wagon loaded up, and around both buildings and. I don't think like I don't think any of us ever suspected he was gonna make it back. No. Like, all right, he might make it down the end of the parking lot, but there's no way he's coming around. And then he would just be trucking, yeah. screaming and yelling, "Y'all goddamn motherfuckers! He thought you were gonna kill me!" <laughs> he, I mean, like, there was zero quit, and then he would jump and, and then he, jump he, out the gym. Yeah, he it was amazing how he jumped. Yeah, and um, but it was that dynamic. But to his personality. He's such a funny dude. Mm -hmm. Like mostly, uh, like not intentionally. I remember when all you guys were lined up doing um, uh, rap pin pulls from pin three mm -hmm. with double over minis, and AJ went, you went, I think Harold went, and then TJ forgets what he's doing, goes down yeah. to a floor press <laughs> floor. and just pushes a like, <laughs> like, uh, like, like what, what is happening? Or he forget he's running the monolift. <laughs> yeah. But he would get everyone so aggravated, mm -hmm. it would step everyone's game up. Yeah, he'd get everybody so mad. Yeah. He'd be like, TJ, are you mm. spotting? I need a spot for it. Just lift it. I have 500 pounds on this right now. You don't got to worry about me spotting if you just lift it. And you get so mad between TJ and Harold. 
I think every PR I've ever hit is probably a combination of TJ getting me pissed off and then Harold talking shit, shit. to me yeah. because of how mad I got from TJ pissing, <laughs> pissing me off. It's like, yo, TJ would fuck something up. You would tell him about it and then you'd argue with you about it. And then Harold would be like, I bet you, you can't outlift him today. And he'd be like, what? Now we're in this and everybody's chirping and talking shit and everybody's hitting a PR and you don't want to be the person that loses. So now you're just going to add more weight onto it. And I say my, my dumb gene got birthed in probably like high school, but that's where it got like cemented. Yeah. It was like, it was fuck you, Harold. <laughs> talking shit, God damn it. Well, that's where I... It- I remember to where it goes against what you thought you had to do as a coach. Most of the time was pulling you guys back. Yeah. It was like, you, you were the greediest bunch of fuckers I've ever met. Greedy go home grumpy. Yeah. To where like, there was like a five pound PR wasn't just cutting it. Mm-mm. Especially when everyone got PR, like, okay, who's, yeah. who's going to keep going? Yeah. Who's going to keep going? Um, I think like we got a bunch of TJ stories, but just to give more to him, I remember he came in with Ori initially because yeah. he came a separate way than we with Matt mm-hmm. and he came in one day, trained with Ori left and then he turned up the next day i'm like what are you doing here, <laughs> you doing here? he's like, he's like oh, i thought i could keep coming I'm like no yeah i'm like not until you can uh, deadlift 405. dude he came back a few weeks later mm-hmm. he deadlift a 405 conventional then did a sumo just to ensure <laughs> just because there's no ambiguity of him mm-hmm. getting no in here i can do train. this both ways it's <clears throat> awesome man of all the training you've done through here and of all the people you've met mm-hmm. and like Pretty fortunate to see you mature in your way mm-hmm. through here. What are the takeaways um, you have from working with Matt? Um, consistency is everything. Um, working hard is one of the most important. You can't come into the gym and and bullshit or or slack uh having people to push you one thing that matt has always had is had uh younger guys that were chasing him Mm -hmm. which i've seemed to find is really important um having when you're the top guy it's easy to you see some people that are the top guy in their group or whatever and they want to continue that hierarchy Um, but you can't improve if you don't have anybody to push you. Uh, I had somebody tell me that in in order to improve, you have to have someone that's better than you because you're always chasing somebody. You have someone that's like equal to you because you're going through it with somebody, and then someone that's chasing you because that's going to push you to be even better. And the one thing that Matt always had was a crew around. Like All of us were brought around because of, some kind of proximity to to Matt and what he yeah. had going on. He felt like he needed had a need for each individual person in that team in that camp, and they all served a purpose to push him to where he could be the best as, that he could be. Being around that, that's kind of how I've learned to structure my camps. Like I've always chased Matt and AJ. They've always been AJ's like my big brother. I've known him since I was fourteen. That's always been somebody that I've had. We were going have been going through it together, but he's the one that got me into it. Uh, Matt is the big dog. So obviously chasing him. Um, I've started to try and get some young guys. I have some young guys that I train with that are, I don't know if they view me like that, but they push me. So I know what, what the relationship is there. Um, And then just a matter of being consistent. As long as you're always in the gym taking things seriously as 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 serious as possible because this is a serious sport and we're doing serious things you can get really hurt and really injured um that's what's going to pay off if you continue to do the same thing daily and work as hard as you can at it the improvement's going to come um and eventually you're going to fall in love with the results that you get uh so where i was an athlete when i first started off when i built that consistency is now i need to go to the gym instead of like i want to go to the gym this is something fun it's now a need for me to to be here. Like when I wake up, I don't want to be up at seven o'clock in the morning, but it's something that I need to do mm-hmm. in order for my goals to get to get met. And the only way for my goals to get met is for me to be consistent in what needs to happen in order for that to it's like all like a chain of events. Yeah. Um and I've watched at two people that are the definition of consistency. Like 
good, bad, or indifferent, their dreams are going to get, get achieved based on what they're doing. Yeah. Matt in the gym 24-7. AJ, you can't get him to leave a gym. Like, if he's not in a gym, he's doing something, shadow yeah. boxing something. And those are the people that kind of raised me in, in this. So when I see what they do, I try and replicate it as much as possible. Uh, I'm a little bit different with how mm -hmm. I go about things just because we're all individuals. Um, but like as far as me maturing, it was coming from being an athlete that kind of got it, like I spoke earlier. Um, I didn't really take things all that seriously. I'm naturally like a go and flow jokey kind of guy. But as I've gone, gotten older and developed as not only a martial artist, but just a man in general, I've built that consistency and seeing what hard work gets you. Like I was talented off of genetics. Like mm -hmm. I'm athletic. If I'd never have touched a weight, I'd be fast or and things like that. But I got into a sport where the results are what you put into it. So the only way for me to get the results I want is to be as consistent as possible. How has your prep for training camps and fight changed over the past eight years? So before I'll say it, I had like a two year gap where I didn't, didn't fight. I had health issues and then came back those first six years I would say the mass majority of my training was lifting and sparring. And whether it was lifting hard the week of fights, good, bad, like, didn't matter how I felt, I was coming in and lifting. Um, I didn't really focus too much on technique. I was training with two guys that are world beaters. Yeah. And if I spar you, these guys I'm fighting aren't aren't shit. And if I get really strong, you're there's no one that I've ever gotten into a cage with that felt relatively close to the amount of strength that I have from yep. being here. Um, after taking that time off, I kind of had some time to reflect on the different things that have happened in my amateur career. Because I came back, I had one amateur fight, then I turned pro. Um, I was fat when I got back. I was like 250 pounds when I came back from that two-year yeah. layoff. Um, so I had some, had to do some shit that's a little bit different than normal. It was like, usually I can lift as much as I want, but I'm trying to get some weight off me. So I had to like adjust my, my training to, all right, I'm going to focus on maintaining the amount of strength I have, but also I need to focus a little bit more on the stuff outside the gym. Also, yeah. since I'm coming back from something and I have my goals, my goals are still the same, I have to sit out and figure out the best way for me to do that. All right, I'm 250. I want to fight at 170. I need to take some time to get get this weight off me. Mm -hmm. All right, so take the time, get the weight off me, and then come back, get back into lifting like a madman, kind of like I've used to. But I had to take some weight off in order to do that. Otherwise, like, what the hell am I doing? <clears throat> then I have to sit back and think of, all right, in that first six years, what could I have changed to make myself a better martial artist? Now I got to kind of curtail and I've talked to you a little bit about it. Like, Hey, I'm can't be in the gym for a little bit. I got to, mm -hmm. I'm going over here to train. Um, I need to double down on this. My body hurts a little bit, uh, but taking those steps and communicating with you where before it was more so you say, jump, jump how high I'm jumping on whatever you, you want. Yep. But now it's a little bit of a dialogue back and <laughs> forth. Cause you don't know if I don't say, say what's going on with mm -hmm. me. If, Hey, I got to focus on this because this next guy is this. All right, maybe I need to take a little bit step back so I can double down on my jujitsu because I need to, I'm fighting a black belt. Mm -hmm. But taking the, the time to myself to put my ego aside because I love, I love, 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 love lifting. Mm -hmm. Like I, it boosts my ego. Picking something heavy up off the ground is cool. But taking more of my sport into, uh, into a consideration into my training. Yeah. Making this a uh, just like accessories are um, something that adds on to your to your main lift mm -hmm. to help out with that. This is an accessory to what my sport is, and taking the steps to a convince myself of that because mm -hmm. it was a long time where it was I sparred and the lifting was the main part. It's like all right, I'm really strong. I know how to spar and fight, so when I go in there, I'm strong and I can do this. Instead of now, it's more so I'm a martial artist and this supplements that. Now my, my, uh, my strikes are sharper or more explosive because of what I'm doing in here. Yeah. Being able to take myself mentally and really understand where the, 
the carryover in what we're doing is going to benefit what I'm doing in the gym on the <laughs> other side of things. I think the first six years of the group, like, um, we 100% did too much. Yeah. But I don't regret it because you don't know how much you can do mm -hmm. or what you should go back to unless you go too far. Yeah. And thankfully, we push it too far and relatively had little to no injuries of it. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right that whenever we started giving feedback, it made this so much better. So much better. Um, yeah. And I think, too, we mistook um, or mistook. West, I was always here. Mm -hmm. It was consistent. Like, it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, so if Matt had to go out of town or something, like, it was here. Mm -hmm. You turn up, we, we there's gym's going to be open. Right. And I think we mistook that just because uh, you can doesn't mean you should. Right. But we definitely did. Definitely did. And, um, but, it, like, I mean, we progressed it into the system there is today to where a two-and-a-half-hour workout six years ago was, like, oh, that was just normal. Yeah, just and normal. And then we realized, like, how dumb that was. And, like, mm -hmm. Louis gave us enough room to figure stuff out. And um, it's pretty cool to see where it is now mm -hmm. and the level of feedback to understand of, like, hey, I'm feeling something. Mm -hmm. What What is going on? You're right. Because um, then that allows us to, like, let's adapt it right adapt, now. Adapt, yeah. And to understand, like, that strength conditioning is a cog in this whole mechanism that is sports or in, especially MMA. Mm -hmm. And I think being able to have access to, to doctors and therapists now. Yeah. Like, that's a big thing. And, and to look at, like, therapists rather than reactionary of, like, hey, maybe we should go there before something happens. Mm -hmm. And now we have this feedback loop of all this information right. coming in where we can dial in training. And um, like, I really think you've dialed in hugely when to taper off strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. You know exactly to the point. You know what exercises work, what doesn't work. Yeah. You speak up to her like, hey, this is just fucked. Like, what, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then two, bouncing around. Like, I was pretty pumped, obviously, from maths to down to strong style. Mm -hmm. So you got immortal martial arts and strong style uh, MMA. But then bounce up to Vegas. Well, yeah. what, what was that like going up there? Um, it was eye-opening. I got to go out. Obviously, I've been around Matt, but Matt's one, one way of training. Being able to go out there, lucky enough to know Lance, so I'll go out there and kind of get like a warm welcome out there because yeah. he's the man. So go out there and see what that community, because Vegas is like a community of fighters. It's like, like a fight town for real. Yeah. Um, Anything that you could possibly want fighting related is there at your disposal. It's just a matter of knowing the right people. And and a lot of those guys cross train with each other and really? do. Um, it's a completely different environment than it is. Are they here. pretty open to each other? Uh, yeah. So it was odd. So like, say here, uh, well, I won't, I mean, won't even put names on it, but uh, you'll see guys from one gym at. So I went out there and I'll spend most of my time when I'm there at Extreme Couture. There was guys at Extreme Couture who I don't don't know who you are, but turns out you're a syndicate guy. And those are two completely separate gyms on, I don't know if they're opposite sides of town, but not the same gym. And then they're training like the whole time I'm there. So I'm thinking that you're a, a Extreme Couture member. I go to the PFL fights and I see him, uh, see the guy that's from syndicate cornering a guy against a <laughs> Extreme Couture member. Yeah. And it's no skin off of each other's backs. It's not any beef. It's just, this is a business. This is a sport. Hey, I'm in this gym. I need to come get what I need from your, uh, maybe my jujitsu works better with your jujitsu coach. Yeah. So I come over here. Um, that, I went out there with, uh, was out there with Lance. But I went out there with uh, one of my good friends, Max Metzger, who's a, a fellow 170 pro from Columbus. And when we went out there, I had just met him, kind of. We kind of knew each other yeah. through, like, through other people. Um, but when we got out there, we, like, linked up. And the entire time we talked was about how crazy it was how everybody cross-trained out there. Like, everybody, like, strength, pre strength training, they cross-train. Regular training, they cross-train. Only time they don't mess with each other is if, if we have to fight. Yeah. Cool. I'll go my separate way. You go your separate way. And... I feel like what Columbus was missing, it was a lot of individuality, like nobody wanted to train with each other. Yeah. And what I got personally from being out there is I can't look, I can't, I don't want to be the best fighter in Ohio. 
my goal is to be the best fighter in the world. And with that, I can't be worried about you down the street being a 170 and me not training with you because you're in the same weight class. Yeah. Yo, I might never fight you. I haven't had, <clears throat> I've had one fight in Ohio in all my pro fights. And that was some dude I don't know. But everybody else, I've been traveling around the country fighting. So it would be do me a disservice to not train with these guys right down the road when I have good talent here. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it that way until I went out to Vegas and saw these guys that I watched guys that are all in the top 10 in one weight class, all in the same training session, getting after it with each other, dapping each other up. And I know y'all are going to fight. I've seen a couple of them fight after seeing them. I'm like, y'all were training together a couple weeks ago and now you're scheduled to fight. And if you have that talent around, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like if you're good at one thing, I was just talking to uh, that guy, Max, on the way here, mm -hmm. uh, trying to get something lined up for us to train. It's, he's a, in my weight class and he's really good. Like that somewhere down the line, we could cross paths because of the sport. Who yeah. knows? That's one of my boys. I probably wouldn't fight him, but it's still in the realm of possibility. Right. But until then, we're still young, young in the game. So why would I, when you have a skill that I, I could learn from you and I have a skill that you could learn from me and say that time doesn't come for like three years. That's three years of wasted time that we've been living right next to each other. Not true. Yeah. Doesn't even make any sense, but it was a matter of having that going out there, open my mind to even having that be a possibility instead of being, Oh, I need to keep all my secrets to myself and yeah. doing all that. And once you make a community where it's like that, where there's a lot of cross training happening now, and I don't want to say that me and Max came back and kind of fostered that community, but it's happened where everybody's cross training. Dante brings his guys down. I know some guys were going up there. Uh, they come into a mortal. We go into Ronin every once in a while. But now you see everyone's getting so much better because the community's been been built. Yeah. Where all right, you might train with this guy and I might train with him, but he's going to teach me something that you learn, and I might use that better than either one of you because that works a little bit better with my stuff. And now when I get better, someone else is going to get better. And now Ohio, the Ohio MMA scene is on the, on the way up. We have a lot of good young guys coming and I don't want to be the person to say that I think it's because of me, but we came back and I know I had a change in mentality and was open to training more. Yeah. Now we're blessed to have Matt here to where Matt is a name and Matt's has put it, put ego aside. There's a lot of guys where, they open up gyms and these are my guys and no one else can come in. Matt fosters an environment to where he allows guys. He has certain times like on Saturdays at one where he allows Dante and all the grapplers from around the town. We have guys from Cincinnati come up and everybody has a it's a good community. It's not any egos. It's we're mm -hmm. here to get get good working and get better. And we're starting to have a little bit of a reflection of what I saw in Vegas here. And that's really cool to see. How important is it to you to just for a situation like that to pay it forward for the next generation? Really important. I've, uh, I was actually just talking the other day about, uh, I, I spoke about having the guys chasing me. There's a, a guy that I've been training with <clears throat> for, I'm four and one as a, as a fighter. He's all my pro fights. He's been one of my main training partners. His name's Gavin Baisden. And he's a two and oh amateur. And I was the guy that I only want to train with people that I know. So a mm -hmm. lot of my training has was solely with AJ for a point in time. And eventually Gavin's Gavin's just around in the gym, rest, can wrestle and everything. And I don't even think he wanted to fight. Um, but I need a trainer partner. Sometimes age we're adults. We got other yeah. stuff going on. Um, but start training with Gavin more. And I'm starting to see like, him grow into like his own from like before he was just a wrestler. Now he's a wrestler to grapple. Now he can strike and seeing that has kind of put like the battery in my back to kind of like help out a lot of the, a lot more of the younger <laughs> guys coming up. Cause I'm like, Oh, if we have a trade, cause I'm a striker. I don't, I'm not the best grappler. I try and get better at my <laughs> grappling. Gavin is a really good grappler. So it was like osmosis. His striking has gotten a lot better my grappling has gotten gotten better and it's a nice little trade-off yeah um then gavin goes and works with the other young guys now we have like a crew that comes in on sundays and we all work together and 
again, another community within the community that we kind of train with and are able to <clears throat> bounce one off of, off of each other. Um, when you're an individual and you're not willing to give back, you're doing yourself a disservice because, <clears throat> all right, I might train with Gavin, right? But there's another guy that Gavin trains with. And if I'm just a stickler about I'm going to train with this guy, there's a whole nother skill set and tools, information, people, uh, resources that I'm not getting by holding everything to myself. Mm -hmm. You only you go grow a garden by uh, adding other plants to it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you only have one plant in a pot, you got one plant in a pot. But if you want a whole jungle, you got to get some soil, put a whole bunch of seeds in there and then water that shit. And once it grows, you're like, damn, I got something out of this. And being able to kind of change my mindset into where, all right, if you are willing to come in and you're consistent, Gavin is the most, one of the most consistent people I know. Yeah. Um, getting other consistent people, add some more consistent people. Now everybody's growing because every Sunday, you know who shows up? Gavin and the guys. I know that I can come in, get something out of it. Hopefully they're getting something out of it. And then eventually the plan is, we're fucking people up all across the world and making a whole bunch of money. Um, but if that, that never happened or never had that switch in my mindset, then I, I don't think I'm where I am today. I don't think I'm as good of a fighter, a good, of a, good of a person, um, good of a man or husband. If I'm trying to be the individual that I was at some point. What, uh, what influence has Marcus the strong side had in you? All, all the influence. So Marcus, Alex, and all those guys have kind of helped. I look at Marcus as, I don't want to say like a father figure, but that's like my MMA dad. Like Marcus is like one of the most awesome people I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, he's one of those guys where, all right, coaching wise, he has a whole lot of, whole lot of information. Mm -hmm. He's Seen it all, done it all. Hard motherfucker. Like, he's one of a kind. But the amount of heart that that man has is, is amazing. And I can't, like, I feel like being around all of you guys, I'm like a representation of, mm -hmm. of little bits and pieces of each one of you. So I carry that with me. And seeing how he is as a man has helped me be good as a man. Like, he had his, I remember him having uh, his son run around the gym. Yeah. I bring my son into the gym. There's nothing wrong with having your kids around this stuff. Yeah. Um, hey, you can make it, if you can make it up, we'd love to have you here. He doesn't have, he doesn't know me from, from Louis is the reason why I'm there. Louis and you vouch for me. He doesn't know me from anywhere, but I feel like that's family now. Like his heart is really the biggest influence I, that I have. Like I get even a little emotional talking about the guy. Like, He's fucking awesome. Uh, shit. Had two years. Ah, oh, fuck. Well, I didn't think I was going to do this shit anymore. And I fucking love it. And he took me back with open arms. Like, I dropped off the face of the plane. You know, I was consistent as can be. And the shit went left. And uh, I just stopped. Didn't think I was ever going to be able to, A, do this again. B, shit, I'm going to pat myself on the back. I'm pretty fucking good at it. Uh, be able to do it at the level that I do it as. And that man said, if you can make it, I'll have you. And look at me now, like I'm, I'm not the biggest thing, but I'm way better, way farther than I ever thought I would make it. And, uh, fuck. It's really a testament to him and him and Alex and the guys. Uh, shit, they really saved me. I was in a dark spot. When you came back after that two year layoff, we'll call it. Well, how hard was that first step? Uh, Really, really, really hard. I couldn't, didn't even recognize myself. I was drinking every day. Again, I was 250. I'm a, I'm a 170. I was like, in the went from the best shape of my fucking life 
to a 250 pound man <laughs> with <laughs> with blonde hair <laughs> uh but i'm gonna be honest the only reason i came back was i was calling aj and he find he he picked up we had been playing phone tag with each other and i pick up and he said something to the line. I was like, what's up, you fat motherfucker? <laughs> and he was like, bro, he's like, dog, you, you, like, you got to get in the gym. I, I don't even want to talk to you right now. Like, like, what the fuck is going on? And my best friend brought me back. I was like, hey, I'm going to be here at this time. Show up. And that gave me just enough of a, like, a battery in my back to take that step, get over whatever the fuck I thought about myself, how I was feeling. Fuck it. Somebody else see something in me. Yeah. And we talk about it all the time. It's like, you ever seen uh, Forrest Gump where he's dragging Bubba through all the <laughs> landmines? <laughs> AJ's Forrest Gump and I, I was uh, <laughs> Bubba. And just, come on, Bubba. And time after time, I've had, I've been blessed to have people to, that see something in me that I might not see in myself to help bring me along this journey I've been on. What, what was it? What, it was something to do with your stomach? What? Yeah, so I got like... It turns out, I don't even know whether it just compiled over time, but I cut to 170 while having a, like a stomach infection. And made weight, fought, won, but then immediately started getting sick. Like when I was starting to eat food, I would, it was just going up and out either way and couldn't keep food down. Finally went to the doctor. They were like, your intestines or I had a colonoscopy and they're like, your intestines are scarred up and everything's like uh, ravaged. So my body stopped processing everything a certain way. Uh, and then my gallbladder sh shut down on me or started to shut down on me. I think it was just a combination of things at one time. And I was going to like three or four different doctors and they were all giving me different information and nothing was seeming to work. They had me on like uh anti-nausea medication, pain meds, because my stomach was just like, I would eat, my stomach would just go into knots and cramp up. Like, I couldn't move from bed. Uh, it was some of the worst pain I've ever been in. Um, and I was working, like, working a full-time job, trying to train and do this, and eventually training and trying to go to work while my stomach is in shambles. Like, I had bills had to be yeah. paid, so I had to make a decision. Um, and just kind of went along and I think eventually I did get better but I was so far down the rabbit hole that I didn't think I was going to be able to come back and then that's where depression starts hitting in alcoholism the whole nine so it's probably a year of sickness and then another year and a half of fuck well the shit I loved is gone yeah let me I went into I went into dad mode I had a, like a kids and everything um, I obviously try to hide all like the the depression and being a drunk and all that shit from them, but I mean, that's just the reality. And eventually, just had to dig myself out of that hole. Like it's crazy to see the difference in you now compared to the miles that first came to the gym, the miles who because when you first started having issues, I remember like someone barely touch your stomach and you be yeah. inch. And then because of the way the atmosphere was, like, dude, are, are you just fucking doing this to yeah. me just to get the fuck out of this workout? Yeah. And then we kind of realized, oh, shit, there's something here. But to see you now and to see the way you balance everything, um, and maybe we'll touch on that, like, how hard is it to be a professional MMA fighter, figure out enough time to do your skill work, then figure out time to get in here, do some strength work, work a full-time job, and have a family. Personally, I don't think it's all that hard. Only because it's everything outside of work and family is some shit I want to do. Yep. So I got to make time for it if I want to. I'm My wife is amazing and allows me to just be a, a wild man. Because she knows anytime that I'm not in here or at Immortal or at Strong Style, I'm with her and my family or I'm yep. working. So I'm lucky I have someone that understands understands that because I've seen plenty of people not have a partner that understands that. But 
it's really just time time management. I got to, hey, be communicate with everyone to let them know what's going on. Yeah. Like, I got two kids, so if I can't make it because my, kid, my kids come first. So, hey, Tom, I might not be able to make it today. Can we figure something else around it? Communicate. And that's me becoming a, an adult. You know, I used to not communicate <laughs> well at all. But knowing because I have all this stuff, I have to. There's, there's yeah. not really an option to not communicate because otherwise – there's a whole group, again, a community of people that are relying on me, letting people know what's going on. We have a community here where if I miss training and don't let anybody know, you're showing up expecting to have a training partner and I'm not there. Yeah, That's not fair to them. Also, if I have training and I don't explain to my wife or work or what's going on, vice versa. So really, as long as I communicate, everything kind of works itself out. And everybody kind of has a understanding because I've commun learned to communicate better of how everything intertwines with, yeah. with each other. Like my work allows me, gives me a schedule that allows me to train as much as I can because they believe in me. My wife doesn't give me a hard time about being gone all fucking day training and working. Most of the times I wake up in the morning, work out, go to work or train again, then go to work, come home. It's, it's 930. The kids are excited because they want to see me i got to come home help them put together and she has her whole a whole life too yeah. that she that she wants to do um but i just make sure when i'm home they get all of me like i'm not i don't half-ass being a dad in any way shape or form and make them a, a huge part of what i do outside like my wife is part of my camps my kids are a part of my camps mm -hmm. I'm, I'm my kid's favorite fighter i don't they don't have an option. I'm going to make sure <laughs> I'm their favorite fighter one way or the other. Um, but just making sure that they're a part of it. Like if I can't, if I can't come to the gym because my wife has something to do, I'll bring my kids with me because yeah. I don't have, I don't use them as an excuse. Like they think this shit's cool now because they don't know anything, any, any different. My son is probably going to get me out the hood, whatever. Hopefully I get a nice house and then my son still wants to get his mom a nicer house yeah. because he's been in the gym since he was six months old in a crib because we had to get after like daddy's got some shit he wants to do so hey pack you up put you in your pack and play and then we're gonna go go and grind and now watching him it's, it's so awesome like he has a little punching bag and yeah. he's damn near techniqued out at four um my daughter she just got into got into wrestling so they they kind of have it was something that dad does. Now they kind of understand and are gravitating towards it, yeah. which makes it a little bit easier for me to come, come and do my thing. Cause I've made a community again, that's accepting their, they feel a part of it. They, it's not weird for them to be in the gym. It's not, Oh, these guys are punching each other. I don't, I don't want to be around this. It's normal to them. This is a, a, a sport, just like taking your kids to a football game or something like that. Now I don't take my kids to actual fights, but they're in the gym with me yeah. and that opens everything up for me to kind of flourish and do do as I as I need uh, to give you more empathy. A lot more, a lot more, a lot, <laughs> uh, a lot more empathy for uh, a lot of the guys that I saw trying to balance this shit yeah. beforehand and not knowing what they were going through. Like Matt had kids, had twins. twins. Yeah. Like my kids are different. Or my daughter's nine and my son is four. So I have it to where my daughter can at least watch, like not watch, but like be responsible enough for my son to where I can kind of go my do my, hey, make sure yeah. he doesn't burn the gym down. But I couldn't imagine them being the same age and having to deal with that because they can't, you don't have someone that's also responsible. So you have to move and being young and not understanding that and now seeing on the other, like him being number two in the world with twin boys no idea how it does. have no idea yeah. how and how much i know he was training i was there seeing yeah. how much he trained and still being a present and active dad to them is how the fuck did you do it which i understand now yeah because my goal is to be just as good as matt if not better so i gotta make that shit happen myself but doing it i'm like like that that's, he's a bad man to he have did, pulled that off he didn't complain once. One bit, because you can't. No, he like to where, where like Matt, when he does communicate, he fucking communicates mm -hmm. pretty promptly and pretty directly. Um, but when it came to that, he would come in tired. But just there's zero, zero mm -hmm. towards like let's get out of it. Yeah. I remember the one thing he just said was like, "Hey, 
if you keep the door open, I will be there. Yeah, and, consistency. Uh, and that was that was it. Where I'd been a coach back then with no kids. To now, you're like, oh, okay, that they're uh, mm -hmm. you have to give leeway because like. Yeah. The, the, don't get me wrong, but you have to figure out like there's a respect in the time front. Mm -hmm. And like to me still there's like turn up on time is a big thing. But now knowing that, hey, you cannot plan. You can't plan for nothing. Like you can have the best plan, everything mm -hmm. ready at six, and now it's eight. Yeah. And you like there's you just can't get out. Yeah. And crazy. um So your son is four. Four. The the journey you've had uh, to get to where you're at. And if he wants to become a fighter, how would you set him up? Who? I've never thought about this. Uh, so I would. Damn. Shit, it's kind of see. Me, if if his journey is to end up being a fighter, at some point in his teenage years, that would have to be a discussion that we had. That way. Because I became, I was an athlete that became a fighter. So yeah. to become a martial artist, it took time to get into that point. I feel like I'd be way better and a lot farther along if the martial art portion of it had happened earlier. Yeah. Now, not, not even teenage, but just when I started. If I had started and kept the mindset of, like, I started off learning, but then comp competition brought the athlete out of me yeah. um making sure i have that open i probably have pretty these four but i try to have open dialogue with my kids like to where like they feel confident to like just tell me stuff yeah. like um so hopefully when he's a teenager he still feels close enough with me to communicate what his goals are and everything like that and if you wanted to all right well if you're going to be a martial artist and that's what you want to do with it we're going to get into this not with the goal of being a fighter. I don't want you to be a fighter. I want you to be a martial artist first. Mm -hmm. And then when your skills get to a point. So even like this, this is what my idea is for football. Even You get a year flag and get in there and you're going to try your best. And if you do good, you get another year flag. So eventually, if you're doing well and you get to the point to where you really want to play football, We'll put some pads on you, but you're gonna have to earn it to get to get to that point. Same thing if he decided to go down the 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 path of being a martial artist. We're gonna put you into a into a martial art, and then we're gonna continue down this path. And we're not we're not gonna go into you competing. We're gonna can build consist consistency of doing this skill because mm -hmm. I don't want you to get out there and now your knees fucked up before forever, or you get spiked on your head or some shit because you just went into it just to do it and never. Uh, gain the skill, love, or passion for it. And then I got to make sure you're consistent because I've gone through this and seen, you can't do this in half-ass. Yeah. And I'm not going to watch my son get fucked up like I know it's possible because I've, like, when you look at your son, you kind of know what kind of traits, traits there are. And I'm sure there's going to be a little bit of me in there. Um, luckily, he gets to see this version of me. So hopefully I get to raise some of those tra traits yeah. out of him that DNA kind of carries. Um but to like answer your question, I'm gonna put him into a martial art, let him gain that that uh, base of being a martial artist and that love for it before I even bring up or allow him to compete. Because the, having that skill and base is gonna make it to where this shit gets hard. Like it is one of like outside of, because again, we talked about balance in life. There's gonna be a point in time where, all right, you might wanna do this when you're a teenager, but when you're 20 and all your friends are going out to the bars, and girls are wanting you to go out. The martial artist is going to keep you sane and in the gym, and what because you, you're going to have that uh, consistency again of wanting, needing to go into the gym mm -hmm. instead of this is something I want to do. Um, when you're just a fighter, it's easy to go out and drink. I was I was that guy I'd go out and party all weekend and then show up to the gym smelling like alcohol. Like again, you got to have a goal in mind, and when you're a martial artist, you're gonna know that you can't come into the gym like that because you're going to take your your craft seriously. You're going to know that, all right, I need to be here at a certain time and everything like that. And eventually those lessons are going to make him a better man and then also carry over to when he's actually competing. He's going to have all that concrete evidence of who he is 
when those questions start getting asked in the cage, are you in shape? You've already built that ground set from, all right, say he decided he wanted to be a fighter when he was 16, but we built that up. All right, in order to do that, this is what you're going to have to do over the next couple of years in order to get to your goal. That's already going to be ingrained in him instead of something that he's going to have to learn. Oh, I've seen fighter after fighter come in and I want to fight. You're not going to be a good fighter starting off with that kind of kind of mind. I just don't believe that having the mindset of wanting to fight initially is the right path for it because fighting is fleeting. You go out there and fight your first fight and your knee gets blown out and you're done. You're done. Mm -hmm. You might never go back to it. Being a martial artist, all right, well, my knee's gone, but once I heal up, I'm going to go back and do jujitsu, even though I might not might not compete anymore. That's a real martial artist. You see these jujitsu guys that don't compete. They're the most consistent. You've seen them in the gym all the time because they're actual martial artists. Um, competition, and that's where you get into being an athlete. Yeah. I don't want my son to be an athlete. I want him to be a good person that might do athletic shit and might do some other cool stuff. But, I mean, if he wants to fight, that's cool, but I'm really supporting him in whatever he does. I just want, hopefully, I have that dialogue and uh, relationship with him to where he's just honest with what he wants to be, and then I can support him as best I can. What are three things that you would tell an amateur fighting starting out with strength training? based on everything you've taken from here and everything you've been through. Put your phone down because you got to take it as serious as possible and see so many people that come into the gym and want to be on their phone and it takes from the, the seriousness and in intensity of what you're trying, trying to accomplish. Um, make sure you have good training partners because, uh, again, culture is everything so you don't have a good training par partner that's willing to push you and help you grow you're missing out on on so much because just doing this by yourself is is so difficult but having a good training partner and again just being being consistent put your put your a put your fucking phone down <laughs> like like that's one of the one of the things that's probably as i've gotten older like I used to be on my phone, but as I've gotten older, and I, sound, I feel like I sound like an old man saying this shit, but when you're, as an amateur fighter, you have goals, and in that amateur period, you should be taking everything, you haven't earned the right to, to fucking look at your phone and take half, I haven't earned my right to be on my phone, and I'm a pro, like, the guys that I know that have had 20-something fights that haven't earned their right to be on their phone and then when you see those guys how they behave and go about there you see a certain there's certain characteristics that you see these guys have and when they're in the, in the gym they're serious mm -hmm. now we might have fun and everything but phones down lance comes in puts his little magnet thing on the on the thing and gets after it and then he'll probably touch it if he has a phone call or anything else but that's where it's at yeah. dante comes in puts his phone down it doesn't get touched to until he needs to change the song. I come in, I've started to put my phone down, face down, no, don't touch it. Because yep. you're in there with a singular focus. That builds, again, the consistency because you need, when you're in there and, and you're in the cage, you don't need anything taking your focus off of that. That's another skill that you're building is, all right, if I have a task, can I focus on that? And at some point, this shit in here, when we're grinding and doing the strength training, I have, have like meltdowns in the middle of every every workout. And it's easy when the workout gets hard to go get on your phone, dilly-dally a little bit, get mm -hmm. yourself a little bit of rest. But that's something mentally that's going to come and get get to you when you're in, in the cage or when things are getting hard, even when life gets hard. Like that's a character trait. Mm -hmm. So you got to have to train, take all the things that are characteristics of what you think someone that's great at what they do and – put them in hierarchy of what you're going to do. I think putting your phone up is like an easy way to get you kind of locked in real mm -hmm. quick. Just put it down. Don't look at it. Get through what you got to do. All right. Make sure if you need, if you have something important to that's happening, have your notification on just in case you have to get to your phone, but put your fucking phone down, be consistent, show up, be where you need to be. And then make sure that you have another training partner that is on the same type of time that you're on. 
because if you have if you're both trying to push each other and you have a guy that's half assing you're not getting pushed yeah like and be honest communicate communicate with with those guys like there's plenty of times where you know during that old old crew you've probably seen some of the craziest arguments because someone I either wasn't consistent i was vacation man Yo, I'm going going to Florida <laughs> for with my girlfriend or whatever. When I came back, I would had to be ready for whatever the fuck was going on because I knew these guys were a gonna bust my ass, and then they didn't give a fuck whether I slacked on vacation or not. You're hopping right back in and getting after it, and so I had to make sure if I went on vacation, I was doing some kind of workout. Otherwise, when I come back, I'm gonna be left behind. And having those guys knowing that the guys that were here when I'm gone are still pushing hard, not that. If you have a training partner that goes on vacation and now you're able to slack, you don't have a good training partner because that training partner should A, be busting their ass when they're gone and be expecting you to be killing them by the time you come back. Mm -hmm. That was the one good thing about that crew is like I knew if and either one of us, I feel like all of us kind of had the idea of if one of us, uh, us is gone, that crew that's there getting after it is improving and there's no reason for me. I, I can't come back and be the be in the back of the pack. So mm -hmm. I have to work hard no matter what's going on. Um, so, yeah, put your phone down, have the good training partners, and then just be as consistent as possible. And those those first two are going to help you be consistent because the good training partner is not going to allow you to not be consistent. And when you're in the gym and your phone is down, you have nothing to do but to fucking work. But those would be the, be the things I would say would be helpful. What are three things you are glad we don't do now that we did back then? Belt squat for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Belt squat with blue bands for five minutes for rounds. And the punishments. That's crazy. That's two. I've had like some of the hardest workouts have literally been coming in and we're in the belt squad. Like, remember when we used to get ready for fights? And mm -hmm. it was like, towards the end of camp, it was, all right, you're in the belt squad doing clinch rounds with body weight and bands around it for time. And we just tried and murder each other. <laughs> just I still believe if you can hack it, it is the best carryover. Yeah. To t like, to peak him for a fight. Um like, uh, and I'm not sure, because, like, we all evolved. I, I definitely evolved as a coach with you guys. Mm. Um, the, to me, the biggest respect I could pay you guys is that when you go into a fight, you don't have to worry about being in shape or getting overpowered. Nope. I can't do shit with your skill, mm -hmm. but I can give you enough of you to where, like, okay, if stuff goes wrong, like, you're not going to get out of breath. You're not mm. going to be in there. No. Um... Now, to achieve that, definitely overcompensated on like, hey, yeah. we're going to put you through the absolute ringer. But I remember like, like Louis gave me these little gems. He's like, it's pretty hard to overtrain these guys. Mm -hmm. And he was fucking right. Like, it's, we'd yeah. like, no one get over, like, we would figure it out, like, the whole group would feel it. And usually the group, you wouldn't even have to say shit, but when everyone was at a level of demoralization, we're like, okay, mm -hmm. probably should. <laughs> ease up here for a little bit just a little bit but um yeah the, i think the ramping up on those bell squats like Man, those bell squats they've been able like we have it down to a better art now um i think sleds have overtook mm -hmm. the bell squats yeah but Wait, yeah man those the bell squats like any combination of belt squat <laughs> and and the goddamn punishments i'm so glad we don't i mean punishments are coming back but i don't think it's as extreme yeah. as because because why but the i remember uh lou came in one time and was like uh took the the thick blue band and yeah. wrapped it around the bottom of it and was just like hey hop in that see how that feels and then just left <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. just walked off i think i was telling harold about that i was like man he just left and then we were just in it just yeah. in there legs sh trembling and shaking and I'm like how long were you here i don't know the seed tell me when it sucks I'm like, it sucks now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just seeing like what the limits of like a human body could could do. Uh, I wouldn't tra trade it for the world because I feel like my strength base is 
like even when I wasn't training, I used to tell people I feel like I could go walk into any gym and pick 500 pounds up off the floor like it was nothing. Yeah. And which old little party trick I used to do is I would just come into the gym and just pull shit cold. But yeah, I just felt like my strength base is at a level uh, from that crazy period of time to where like now because of how long those workouts are and how grueling they were, I feel like I hit a point even outside of our strength training, like during like my regular training to where, all right, it got, it's really hard at the beginning, but I yeah. hit a point of suffering to where I'm just in it and I can just manage whatever the hell is going to be thrown at me. And I feel like outside of being physically in shape, that's a mental thing that mm-hmm. I learned during that period of time is that all of us are tough as fuck from that shit because how do you mentally break somebody that can endure that yeah. and then show up again like ag- again and again and again for years like mentally i don't believe my body will fail on me at any point in time like, like uh, you can't physically break me i mean i my last fight he broke my bone but that's yeah <laughs> he just kicked hard and shit so he's an exception fuck that guy but <laughs> outside of that like body to body if we lock up i'm moving you there's there's no no other option and if i can't move you eventually i'm gonna move you because you can't like this horsepower has like a prius engine in it it's like a ferrari yeah it's got all the horsepower in the world but i can drive all fucking day and i feel like my outside of just my strength my strength endurance has hit a point to where like what do you you have to hope and pray that it stops like, yeah you get just and pray pray to somebody because god damn it's um yeah it's, there's a like i do like our philosophy now of being as strong as uh, necessary not as strong as possible mm-hmm. but that strong as necessary is our definition of it yeah and I haven't really heard anyone, you could like, and I'm all, all for cross training and strength and conditioning too, because you go somewhere like Lance coming in, giving us some new tips and stuff that they did mm-hmm. is like phenomenal. But there's not many places I've heard, not that anyone would tell me, I guess, but they go in and you feel like, oh, I can't, I can't mm-hmm. do this. Yeah. Now there is, if you do a new exercise, it's going to be hard because it's a new exercise. Mm-hmm. But we've had plenty of people come in here who are like, what Got is ran this? off the block. And I think the biggest goal and the, like to me, one of the best, I guess, um, how to honor the legacy and how to honor this place through our demographic is that we want you to recalibrate what you think strength is mm-hmm. and what strength is for your sport. And I think everyone here does a really good job of doing that because as soon as we get a visitor, yeah. someone comes through here who has trained mm-hmm. you can just see that looking there like what this is there's something mm-hmm. there's something different, different when you're halfway in a workout and then you're still shifting up a gear to go faster and to push yeah. and to push mm-hmm. or people like the sled workout like or the sled warm-up was most people's workout yeah like sleds people would finish sleds and be like all right we're about to go work out and be confused. Like, I love seeing the, the look on the face, like, after six trips. What? Six trips with, like, three three plates on it, and then, all right, we're going to go inside, and then we'll be back out to pull the war wagon. And the look on people's faces when we're done with the first main lift and about to go do some accessories, and, you know, we're probably got another, like, 45 minutes left. That That look of confusion... And what did I get myself into? But the awesome thing is it's all possible. Yeah. It's not impossible because we're all doing it. Like, that's the the cool thing for me is seeing these guys come in. And this, that's a little bit of my ego is them being confused as to how the fuck this is happening and yeah. this being normal for us. Well, they're so used to sterile. Mm-hmm. Like, you come in. We're going to squat. We're going to do this, this, and this. Like, okay. Well, if I think you're in a routine or you are relying on that, I'm going to change something mm-hmm. up. Because every, the vast majority of, like, everyone who's a pro athlete, you are not in a sport where chaos doesn't rule. Mm-hmm. So if you get so used to a comfort in a groove, like, we are going to change that groove. Yeah. 
there might be like there's no way we did this bar last week and we go yeah you did mm -hmm. and like no you didn't but we're going to change it up to where like it doesn't matter mm -hmm. and like why are we doing sleds in the middle why right. are we not doing it at the start mm -hmm. to where, like, we'll warm up we'll have done a hundred thousand pounds of volume before the workout even starts when i saw sleds on at the end of the workout today i almost shit my pants i was like <laughs> what the, what the fuck is even happening today that's why i love putting jumps at the end of workout yeah because you really have to think about it like okay i have to do a somewhat complex task while fatigued and i have to land it Mm -hmm. and I prefer jumping on a box and down to or doing a depth jump at that time because depth jumps can get out of hand mm -hmm. but at least you have to think You're right. and then it's one of those things where if you jump and you see your training partner slowing down you'll just speed mm -hmm. up and keep going right and that's the good good thing about having good training partners yep. is having somebody that can push you because if you're not getting pushed and you're slowing down the whole crew just kind of dials it back and you can see it like I've, I've noticed in some of the our workouts recently where like you might pull me to side and like, yep. kick it up, kick it up a little bit. Because then you see the other guys start to pick it up a little bit based on like the pace that we're going at. Yep. Or you see guys start to slow down um, and then you, they might slow down for a little bit or they see you see them slowing down and then they start to pick it back up because the group is, again, picking it back up. But you ha having the good training partners. Um, it's amazing having it switch up because <laughs> having Dante around has like pushed me to be like a lot better. I love Dante. Yeah. Um, his personality pushes me. I think we kind of like play off of each other uh, really well. Um, but me and him both don't like it when the workouts switch up. No. <laughs> switch up. So at least it's cool having somebody else that's with me to complain just a little bit about what's going on. But then we bust our asses through the yeah. through the workout. Like I like like that dynamic of all right. We both think this this fucking sucks, but we're about to fucking kill this shit because that's what we're what we're here to do. Um, I'm blessed to have him have him here. It's a, it's amazing. And then getting the other guys up on board with with yeah. it. Like they're starting to come along. Um, getting the guys to, to chirp with me a little bit more is is cool. Um, trying to get them to do it a little bit more because it's not as fun when it's quiet and I'm yeah. just talking. But but it's it's an amazing amazing environment that you guys have here. It's it's fucking well, look, awesome. it's it's you guys bring it. All we do is try match make the people who should be in groups together, which I think we've got a really good yeah. job on that. And my style of coaching is initially I'll be there at the start, but I try mm. instigate in yeah. the background and to where like having people like you have been here for a while, like, hey, you got to push the pace and mm. you know exactly what that means. Yeah. Um, but then you become a good training partner and then you guys have pushed the other group mm. to where have came out of nowhere to try yeah. to crush your like to where you guys finish this, that uh, dynamic combo day in 75 minutes. They literally pushed as hard as I've ever seen anyone go for 63 minutes. That's fucking crazy. And those two lost on a max, brought mm -hmm. Joe with him. And Joe, I mean, Joe is like, he is this freakish athlete in Joe's body. Yeah. Um, it's so confusing. Yeah. It's so confusing seeing like him move and watching him jump with two little paperclip legs with the huge, <laughs> up, it's, it's so, he's a, it's wild watching him do the stuff that he's done, but, them bringing him in has been awesome because like i'm probably one of the bigger guys like i'm probably mm -hmm. the biggest guy probably except for him he's big um so having someone that's there to outside of dante because dante's strong as fuck but having somebody that based off the look test first seeing him i was like oh he might be able to outlift me yeah has like pushed me to yeah. like get my keep my shit together because i like the ability to talk shit at all points in time. So I want to beat everybody yeah. and everything, but having that dynamic between the guys that we have now is awesome. Kind of getting that, that the old group. feel, yeah. feel back again, less crazy, but still the push is starting to get yeah. there. Um, so I'm excited to see where everybody is as we go along, like all, what all we're about to do. And the difference of sports too is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's to see awesome. everyone like, transfer uh, information mm -hmm. uh to wrap up because like, we could talk all day yeah what's the ideal future for you in the next year or two next year i beat ufc contender series uh one of those two 
um, knockout. I say knockout. I'm 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 becoming grappler. Miles is like my new my new thing. I'm about to just start strangling people left and right because uh, I just feel like that's something that with my the amount of strength I have, I honestly feel like if I became a grappler or just develop my grappling game, I'd be able to just pop some heads off, <laughs> just like <laughs> and head just shoot off into the crowd. So. Uh, <laughs> That's a little bit of my personality coming out. But uh, I've been trying to keep it reined in a little bit. But I fuck up a couple more people. Hopefully get that call. Um, get on the, the big show and then show the world what I, what I can do. I feel like if I max out my capabilities, it's in the realm of possibility to be the best fighter in the world. Now, whether I get there or not, that's just to be seen. But I want to put myself in the best position um to achieve my goals as possible if i try my best put my best foot forward again i carry all of you guys with me so represent everybody that's like held me down the best as i can i'll be happy in the next couple years if that all works out i should be hopefully holding a belt up you know put a belt up up in the little front office or something like that and then a couple years from there hopefully i'll be able to give back to the community coach some people uh hopefully my son's a little bit older and i can watch him do do whatever he wants to do my daughter too my daughter's probably gonna be uh hitting home runs in like oklahoma for like softball <laughs> or some shit but yeah just continue to continue to grow as a person as a dad as a as a fighter um and just live life well it's been a pleasure working with you so far and yeah, it's uh, been a privilege me. to be part of the journey and we look forward to see where you get um i wish there was a uh, a world championship bet for shit talking because I, yeah. I, th I think that that would be an easy belt to get but um yeah i want to give you a lot of thanks and i really do mean it it's been yeah. a privilege so far thank you and i enjoy the journey yes, all right sir. Awesome. next time <laughs>